There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all back to Interverse. I'm your host, Chance, and I'm super extra glad you're tuning in for another episode. On the show in the past, we have talked at length about the tools and perspectives that can best help us align our daily lives with the direction of our dreams and leave the life of the daily grind behind us. Although it may be a desperate fight in the final mutiny against Captain Survival and his evil one-eyed first mate, Financial Security... And it's not always smooth sailing after you take the helm of your own life in the waters of the unknown. There are some seasoned and savvy swashbucklers on the seas of creative independence who travel the world and do their own thing, inspiring us to see what's possible to achieve for ourselves. Today's guest is one such master of his domain, and as a globetrotting musical explorer, he has pioneered a plethora of sounds from his favorite world cultures and forged a path for himself as a model of success for independent musicians everywhere. His name is Steven Suhan, but you might know him better as Just Suhan, under which alias he's produced no less than seven full-length albums, a rash of Wicked remixes, face-melting mashups, and outstanding originals, all representing his signature creative soundscape, ingeniously sampling beats and vocals from sources as diverse as your favorite 90s hits to ridiculous didgeridoos and snippets from worldwide underground-based music. For a long time, I've been a fan of his dance-inducing tunes and... I recommend all of his albums, like 2017's Archetypes and last year's epic production, Transmuto. Steven recently blessed my small hometown with its first ever Suhan show, and after we briefly met, he was kind enough to set aside some time in his whirlwind tour schedule to chat with the Interverse tribe, and as of today's recording, it is Valentine's Day of all occasions. Well, for me, the national holiday of love feels appropriate because I absolutely love the music of Suhan. And if you've been listening to Interverse for a while, you may have probably heard it featured at the end of an episode or two. You can check out Suhan's website, suhansuhan.com, to find his music, tour schedule, booking info, merch store, and much more. And I'll make sure it's linked in the show notes for everybody to check it out after this episode and easily hop to it. You can find his stuff everywhere from SoundCloud to Spotify. And in the show notes, you'll also be able to check out the link to Interverse Plus on Patreon, where you can get some excellent extra podcast content for your pledge of support to the show. And a big thanks to all of you who are already awesome enough to be doing that. Now, if you would please be so kind as to pry open your third eye and let loose an astral energy appreciation laser towards our excellent guest, or maybe just hit him up and say thanks on social media if your psychic powers aren't that strong. And let's get this party started with the prolific performer, dance floor destroyer, and festival favorite, the super heady spiritual guy himself, the one and only Steven Suhan. Thanks so much for being here, my dude, and welcome to Interverse. Thanks for having me. What's up, man? So what's new from you musically and, you know, in life? Oh, man. I guess my <laughs> my life is just wrapped, wrapped in music, basically. Working on a lot of new stuff, doing a lot of research for sampling and just on the road constantly doing shows. I, I just got back from 
Guatemala last week to do a, an ecstatic dance festival. It was pretty amazing. And the next week, I'm off to Costa Rica for an Envision Festival. I've been there one time, and yeah, that doesn't disappoint. Is it your first time playing there? Or probably not. I played there a couple years ago. I think it was 2018. That's awesome. What's it, what's it like playing music in the jungle, basically? It's pretty, pretty awesome. I'm a big supporter of that festival and everything that they do. It's a very well-intentioned event that draws from all over the world. They have great staff and they're just on top of it. They even employ like the local community and at their event for vendors. And they, they really try and boost the local economy and bring something uh, positive to that area as opposed to just coming in and stopping all over it and leaving. So I, I'm a big supporter of their model for festivals. And it's just a great time. Yeah, man, I feel all that. Do you enjoy the spiritually transformational festivals more than the mainstream, like party centric fests? I haven't been to that many big mainstream festivals. <laughs> My realm is kind of these uh, spiritual transformative events. So uh, I say uh, just another day at the office. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's an important conversation to include in uh, music culture and nightlife and, and such. Yeah, I find that. Most of the crews and promoters that I play for have built communities like this, where people are there to support one another, and the party isn't necessarily the focus. It's, it's more about generating community. Yeah, and it works really well. I still have friends that I only met in person one time, the time I went to Envision Festival. It's pretty radical, actually. Like, it's almost as if those three or four days are a mini lifetime. <laughs> the time just really stretches out. Do you ever hang out and stick around at whenever you go to a destination festival like that? Or do you, are you just like in and out on to the next thing? It really depends. If it's an international gig, I'll stay for like three or four nights. This time I'm staying for four nights and I'm already seeing all my <laughs> friends that are going down there staying for a week or two weeks. And I'm like, oh man, I wish I, I wish I could stay longer, but I got to get back to LA and uh, get back to school and everything. But yeah, I will, I will be lucky enough to hang out there for four nights. I have two sets. I'm doing an ecstatic dance set on Saturday. And then my big set is technically Monday morning at like 4.30 right before Closey. So I'm really excited about that. that they, they, they gave me such a great spot. And you mentioned you went to an ecstatic dance festival in Guatemala not very long ago. Uh-huh. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about ecstatic dance. Do you end up dancing ecstatically during your own <laughs> ecstatic dance set? <laughs> this whole world is kind of new to me. I've done a couple of ecstatic dances. I've done a couple on Maui and Hawaii, and I did one in New York City and one in North Carolina. So I've only done like three or four ecstatic dance sets. So this is my first time doing an ecstatic festival. It's different, but I learned to have a new appreciation for this this format of event because it's like a it's like a healthy version of a of a mainstream festival or something. I don't know. Like they the event ended at 10 p.m., so it wasn't like people were staying up all night or anything. And something that I thought was really cool about it was that the there's no talking allowed on the dance floor. It's just strictly for dancing. So you get this vibe where everyone is just really into it and it's pretty cool the older i get the more i appreciate finishing things up by 10 <laughs> yeah yeah i know what you mean but i didn't have any trouble sticking it out all the way to the end of your set whenever you came to visit i definitely didn't <laughs> the music can energize you but i know i've talked to other people in this world before and it can kind of pose a health challenge or a bigger health challenge than most people have to deal with to have a chaotic schedule like a music producer would and having to sometimes have really late night sets. Is that something you've kind of faced at all? Or have you been lucky not to crash and burn at all? <laughs> well, I think I've been touring for about, I'm in my fifth year of touring now, I think. And the first couple of years were definitely very exhausting. I lived on the East Coast and was flying cross country uh, many times a month. And it was exhausting. There were many times where I felt like I could fall asleep right behind the DJ booth, whether I was in San Francisco or, or Portland or wherever I was. And I just kind of had to train myself over the years to, to know how to have the right amount of energy. And it really comes down to uh, sleeping as much as possible, like, especially on the planes. 
for whatever reason, if I don't sleep on the plane or at least try to, when I land, I'll feel more exhausted. So that's kind of my trick is to just close your eyes and try to sleep whenever possible. And then, you know, when I land, say I land at like, uh, I don't know, between 4 and 7 p.m. and wherever I'm playing, I'll usually go and then sleep more so I can have enough energy and be, and be as present as possible during my set. So yeah, sleep is definitely the answer when it comes to touring and, and energy. <laughs> yeah, especially with so much that you're involved in, just having some time to turn off <laughs> the thinking in the brain for a while and the, all the schedule pressures that might be happening. I remember when I went to Envision, I conked out by midnight each night, I'm pretty sure, because I was up all from the morning through the day doing like yoga workshops and exploring the jungle, going to the beach. It was awesome. But I didn't feel like I missed out by going to sleep early. It's just like I've been to festivals where I actually hardly slept the entire time. And the recovery after that is almost like a week of (laughs) total, total like loss of productivity and enthusiasm for the real world. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I feel you. Well, sometimes you have to kind of just immerse yourself in the experience and sometimes you stay up all night and sometimes you go to bed early, but they do offer a lot of really great stuff down there during the day, workshops, yoga, that sort of thing. For my big set of envisions at 4.30, so I'll probably sleep beforehand and then come out a little bit later and then I'll be fine. Yeah, for like 4.30 a.m.? Yeah, 4.30 a.m. Because I think Closey has the sunrise set, so they're going to have me right before her And then at like 6 a.m. or something, she goes on, which is, I believe, right when the sun starts to come up. People will definitely have their second wind start kicking in during your set, I bet. (laughs) The sun will start getting closer and yeah, that's going to be awesome. Kind of wish I could teleport for that. Just uh, (laughs) check that out. Well, I might uh, end up recording my set and releasing it through Envision. So you might be able to experience it even if you don't get to go. Awesome. Yeah. And so can everyone listening too. my favorite way to listen to anybody's music is in like a full DJ mix set. I just I love transitions and I love keeping the vibe going. I, albums are still cool. I still enjoy a good album, but I'm looking forward to hopefully getting that recording, like you said. So uh, <laughs> I'll keep my eyes open for it. Yeah, I feel like uh, our, our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. So people like to hear, you know, our two hour long listening experience. I feel you on that. Yeah. And in that, the DJ can like take you on a journey (laughs) and put things together you never would have necessarily expected. That's really fun. I mean, that's kind of your thing, actually, is mashing up stuff that has probably never gone together before. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Tell us a little bit about the type of music you create and what makes you want to make it that way, because you do have a really unique sound. Like, how would you describe yourself? I use the words vague and familiar to describe my sound. (laughs) I'm really interested in international music, traditional music from many cultures, but also the popular music uh, from many cultures. There's just so much uh, stuff out there. But I'm also very inspired by nostalgia and things that are familiar. So Traditional Bulgarian music is just as interesting to me as the Beatles or, or, you know, hits from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I just like all of it. I really like finding something that I've never heard before that inspires me. But then I also really like something that I have heard before. I'll, I'll, I'll say, ooh, I've heard that in a, a movie somewhere or something. So then I'll just have to buy that song and add it to my collection. So I'm constantly searching for new stuff and old stuff. (laughs) I feel like whenever we stay on the quest for new music and new sounds, in some way it helps us continue expanding our life in new directions. And whenever I'm kind of stuck, sometimes I'll just go back to the same music that I've heard a shitload and play it on repeat. Like not that it's not good to go listen to something you like and you've heard a bunch of times before, but that exploration have opening up that space in your mind for stuff that you've never heard before. I feel like it expands your mental boundaries in some way. Oh, I agree. Totally. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, like your personal story from the start to where you're currently at? You know, you've definitely reached a level of success to be getting to play these shows that we're talking about. And I think 
it'd be pretty inspiring for people to hear about a little bit of where you came from. Thanks for that. Well, let's see. I'm 31 now. When I was 17, I was a freshman in college or eight, 17 or 18 and got on GarageBand immediately. And basically when everyone was making friends and going out their first few months of college, I was in my room making music for that first year. I was making mashups and stuff. It was around the time that like Girl Talk was was doing his thing. So I kind of draw a lot of initial inspiration from him. But I started messing around with with mashups in my in my dorm room on GarageBand. And I made maybe 50 of them or or so. And they actually did pretty well at the time on a website called Pure Volume. Then I uh, the next year, I think I was a sophomore, I started getting interested in DJing and then once I got on Serato Scratch Live, I uh, realized that, oh, I could, I could probably do this. So I started DJing uh, college parties and college bars at the University of Maryland, where I was uh, attending school. Then it, it expanded to going up and down the East Coast with me and my roommate at the time. We were both DJs together, and we would DJ at college parties. Uh, up and down the East Coast, like Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia, North Carolina, and we went to Penn State. So we were uh, just getting around trying to do our DJ thing. And then what happened after that? I uh, moved to New York City for six months and attended an Ableton Live program where I uh, basically learned how to warp samples. And that's kind of what set me on my path to music was learning how to warp these samples correctly. Came back from New York with my partner at the time, and we started throwing events in Baltimore as a promotion company called Manifest. And we were doing big event, underground events in Baltimore. And then we went into a traditional venue. And my business partner at the time started learning about talent buying. So she started uh, submitting offers for shows. And I think this was about 2011 or 2010 or so. And, you know, we did. A lot of the acts that were really big on the festival circuit out west during those years, like we did Tipper in 2012, we did Polish Ambassador, Minnesota, Random Rab, Blue Tech, you know, Pigeons playing ping pong. I went to college with those guys. We actually went to the same schools. So we booked a lot of these acts then, and that's kind of how I got familiar with the whole like agent talent buyer relationship. So then. Fast forward a couple of years, I was I was like, I'd really like to do something with my DJing and my mashups. So I dug up a bunch of my old mashups and polished them up and then started a few new ones. One of them was a super heavy spiritual guy that people probably know if they know my music and and put together that first Made in a Baltimore album. And that's that's how it all started. I made free CDs and I sent anyone who wanted a CD for free you know, that I had handmade with a little wax seal on it. Like I, I had a custom made alien wax seal that I would seal the albums with. And I sent out three CDs for the first two or three albums. And that, and that's kind of how it started to pop off. And then I hired a publicist at the time who helped get my music out to the West coast, basically uh, through SoundCloud and Facebook. And that's kind of how people out West started to, to hear my music. And that's when I started traveling. I remember I went to Chicago as my first trip and then started going out to California more and more. And then over the years, just uh, started going more places, was working with a great agent. And that's how it got started. And I've been traveling ever since. I've had seven albums or remix compilations since then. And I, I put out over a hundred songs, I think, in the past five years. And that's where we're at now. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for the update. Yeah. I think that's a pretty cool story. And I can re recall, actually, I think it was late 2016, maybe early 2017. But there was a point where I heard about your music for the first time. And within a few months of that, as soon as that year's festival stuff started going down, I think it was 2016, actually. As soon as 2016's festival started happening, I was hearing Suhan tracks from like every third DJ. <laughs> really? Yeah. It was just like, I heard of you and then all of a sudden you're everywhere. So 
whatever you have been doing is definitely working. Uh, just getting it out there, I think the music uh, speaks for itself because it is really fun and really different, and it has <laughs> it does have that nostalgia quality that makes it a little extra attractive too. It's like. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot to it. I'm definitely going to play some at the end of the uh, show here so people can hear a few of my favorite ones. But I'm wondering about that whole process of putting on shows out there, starting that whole scene that you became a part of or helped create and what kind of personal development or maybe like spiritual lessons seem to coincide with the steps that you were taking at that time. Is there anything like that? Well, community was definitely at the heart of it. I think the reason that I was so successful was because I had such a great community behind my back. The scenes on the East Coast when it comes to like this kind of transformative culture or burner or whatever you want to call it, they're pretty well connected. So people from New York all the way down to Atlanta kind of know one another. And I was lucky enough to have the support of so many great friends sharing my music when it started. To speak to the spiritual part, like I said, like community was, that was the spiritual thing, you know, having people around and to, to enjoy the, the art and the culture with was definitely at the heart of it. Like, uh, and I still feel that way. Like the music wouldn't be anything without the community that, that, that all of these promoters are trying to curate, you know, we live in a time now where we kind of have really busy schedules. We're in our houses, maybe feel separate from society or what's going on in the world. So an outlet like music with a community, a supportive community is, I would say, one of, one of the more cathartic things that you could do is just having great people around you. And I think it's important, you know, moving forward in this day and age. Yeah. Yeah, brother, for sure. I came out of the shell that was slowly built around me through high school and college by going to music festivals. I mean, music really does bring people together, whereas the rat race is what literally splits people off into little boxes and keeps them separate. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, for sure, I think, like a, a, a provable thing that you can experience for yourself that following what makes you excited and what you're here to create is going to basically put you on a spiritual path without you having to, quote, try to be spiritual, unquote. It's just going to like align, following your creative passion is going to align you with the people that are going to exhibit the spiritual teachings and lessons and information that will be useful to you. And it'll just almost like flow automatically without having to go look for a guru or a teacher or something like you're finding your own path and it's through your imagination and what really matters to you as a human being. I think that it, it kind of works itself out like that synchronistically. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. You know, I've been really lucky and grateful to be where I'm at and following my passions has, has worked out well. And I just really appreciate, you know, all the <laughs> listeners and all of the support that, that I've gotten. And, you know, at the end of the day, I would not, I wouldn't want to do this or, and, and I wouldn't be able to do this without all the, the lovely people that I meet along the way. Like I don't really have a, a traditional so social life in that, you know, every weekend I'm, I'm somewhere different usually. So when I get to the shows and I'm meeting all these awesome people, you know, like yourself, it's kind of what, it's kind of what keeps me going meeting all these great people. You know, it's, if I, if I had to go tour to the shows and wasn't meeting people, didn't get to hang out and talk and, that kind of thing. I'm not sure I'd, I'd, I'd want to do it. So, you know, the, the, the people that I meet are, are really inspiring to me and it, it, it makes it all worth it. That's awesome. Yeah. You probably got friends all over the place now. <laughs> yeah. Right. I do. I'm lucky. I have friends all over North America and it just, it, it I, I make more of every weekend it seems, you know, and people ask me like, where's your favorite place to go? And what's your favorite city to play in or something like that. But whenever I think my favorite is when I get to come to a new, a new city. So when I went to Columbus, Ohio, or when I came to Springfield, Missouri, like it's just great to come to a new place and see like the culture is thriving in, in whatever way it is there. So yeah. Yeah. I just love coming to all these new places and meeting these people. It's very um, fulfilling. Absolutely. And then the other way that art brings people together is it brings 
artists together. You have some really cool like cover art and stuff for various albums and songs. I know one of the artists you've worked with is the great visionary artist Mugwort. And so I was wondering what's it like to work with other visual artists and some of the musical artists you've got to collab with. How has that been on the recent path? It's been like a dream come true. Honestly, I was looking at Mugwort's art when I was maybe a decade ago, when I was like 21. I never dreamed that I'd meet him or we'd work together. But the first time I played Shambhala, he was actually doing my visuals. And then when I found that out, I was like, oh my God, Mugwort was doing my visuals. So I, I sent him an email and and told him I was a big fan of his work. And it turned out he was a big fan of my work too. So that was like an Another dream come true to, to know that someone that I looked up to so much was listening to my music. And then we ended up working together and he did a great uh, album cover for me for Collective Effervescence. And it was awesome. And, you know, collaborating with different musicians has also been really cool. I, I'd have to thank David Starfire for, you know, supporting me in my efforts a, a, along the years. He helped kind of paved the way for this global fusion sound on, Amer- on American dance floors. And, you know, I'm grateful to him for supporting me. I've had other opportunities to work with great artists like Antenne, who I'd been listening to for years. So we ended up doing a, a tour together and making a track. And yeah, it, it's really cool. And then I've also done a fair amount of reaching out to artists around the world through email. And I've had some really cool opportunities come out of that as well. Cold calling people on the internet can definitely be discouraging because, you know, for one out of every 30 or 40 emails or people that you try to contact, you know, you might hear back from like two. So it can be discouraging, but it, it, it does work if you do it enough. I had an opportunity a couple of years ago to work with the professor of Eastern Vocal Arts at Berkeley School of Music, which is like one of the best uh, music schools in the world. Uh, her name is Christine Karam. And she is a a vocalist and a vocal teacher that teaches in many styles of traditional singing, especially Middle Eastern, Eastern European singing, which I'm extremely fascinated by. So to work with her was like another dream come true. And then last year, I linked up with this guy in Finland called Nico Heikenpoika. And he does a combination of traditional Finnish music mixed with throat singing, which is a Mongolian traditional style of singing and that, that went really well. It was an amazing song that came out on the, what was a circulate comp- compilation from Gravitas recordings. And just last week I, I was able to land a remix with this Palestinian hip hop group called Dom. And they have been active in, they're one of the biggest Palestinian hip hop groups that's been around since the nineties. And they're really big on social issues and bringing us, uh, uh, taboos and political issues uh, into their music. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, the song that, that we're remixing is kind of a satirical song about cultural pressures in, in their, within their culture to get married. And it's kind of like, I'm not getting married. It's this, this, this dance song that's kind of like a, a satire about, about getting married and personal freedom and, and self-growth something that I thought was really interesting when I was reading about them this week is that, you know, they had said that a lot of their music in the past was about real issues, dark, dark stuff, political stuff. And their for their newest album, they're kind of, they changed their approach and it's more about like self love amidst, amidst these horrible problems in the world. So, and they say like, you can still have fun and you can still dance to the drums of revolution. And I kind of took that, to heart. And I was like, you know what? They're right. We can be political. We can be progressive, but we can also love ourselves and have a great time along the way. Why not? Wow, man. Well, you touched on like at least three different things I'd love to go back to. In that. <laughs> sure. But the, you know, I want to say for people out there who may have also tried to get a hold of people, random uh, individuals on the internet or to whom they may seem random, you know, I realize doing that myself just to try to get people on the podcast that, like you said, oftentimes the success rate of getting a, a response or a positive response can be low. But once you get to the point where you're the one being contacted for uh, by, you know, 
various people for various reasons, you realize it actually gets to be pretty hard to respond to more than just a few a day or a few a week, depending on how busy you are. So you shouldn't let it discourage you if you don't hear back from somebody that you maybe want to collab with or just contact. Maybe they will get back to you in a few months or maybe just keep reaching out and trying to make connections because that's never like a bad intention to have. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, sometimes I've hit people up that I really wanted to be in contact with and, you know, no response. And at the end of the day, like, what are you going to do about it? It really just comes down to, it comes down to timing. You know, sometimes someone will hit me up and it will be just the right time for me to respond to them. It's kind of just a divine timing thing, you know, but, but like I said, persistence is key and, you know, you keep putting yourself out there. Eventually you'll get something back. I was recently discouraged about it because, you know, I'd, I'd hit so many people up and I wasn't getting many responses. So I'd kind of taken like an approach where I was like, I'm just going to focus on myself and I'm not going to work with many other people and that sort of thing. And I kind of had a, a realization to get back out there and to start sending more emails again, because there's just so many people out there you could potentially work with and, and so many different connections. And yeah, it's, at the end of the day, you know, it's just a matter of persistence. Yeah. You don't have to stress about it because you're heading towards your destiny, no matter what things are going to go as they will. Like you don't want to bank on one person for your opportunities or your future or, or anything. So just keep it moving. You know, someone doesn't answer, keep going, keep working on your craft. Talk, talk to some, talk to some other people. You know, there are plenty of people out there to talk to you. So if you, if you don't get in touch with this one person, then it shouldn't affect your, your career path too much. Yeah. And, and sometimes it really is right to do, as you say, and go back to focusing on yourself or focusing on the craft itself, because it's, you know, your attention and your time are the most powerful form of energy that you have. And if you keep putting attention and time into a, a thing that you've created a body for, then it's going to grow event. Like it may be a type of seed that takes a long time to start to poke up over the dirt, or maybe it'll be one that starts out with a big spurt and then is small for a while. You can't know, just keep watering it with, <laughs> just keep putting the energy into it in the time for sure. Exactly. And now, you know, I, I have a better chance when I do uh, contact someone overseas or something and, and I say, Hey, would, I'd love to do a remix for you, for you. Why don't you check out my work? And then they can go and see all the stuff that I've done. And that's probably the reason that they say yes. If I only had like, if I didn't have any songs to show them or a couple, then why should they feel the need to collaborate with me? Yeah. And another thing that you mentioned earlier was the satire song about marriage and about expectations culturally between, you know, partners and it is Valentine's Day today. So without needing to get more personal than you want, of course, I would love to hear some of your thoughts on romance in an age where boundaries are rapidly dissolving and the definition of love is constantly evolving. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're putting me on the spot here. Well, I'm not, I don't, I don't necessarily think of myself as a love guru or anything, but well, as long as both people are happy and are pushing each other forward and helping each other realize their dreams, you know, I'd say that that's a, a successful partnership. It's great to be in love, but but at the same time, you know, you personal growth is just as important. And if you feel like you are pursuing your dreams or or closer to them, or if, if you're happy, then then, then sure. Why not? You know, what, whatever, whatever makes you happy and pushes you forward. I know that the, the way that, that, that people love is definitely changing. You know, there are, there's more open dialogue about the institutions that, that we are conditioned to be a part of. And there's more breaking of the mold than, than there used to be. People are loving in new ways. There's this whole conversation about monogamy uh, or non-monogamy. I don't really feel one way or the other about it, but it's good to know that they're a constant conversation about evolution, pushing forward. How can we become better people? And yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. The conversation between monogamy or what some call maybe polyamory. I feel like it's really useful if you're in a partnership where you or the other person is like, wanting to do something unconventional like that, that you both just communicate clearly to each other and uh, respect 
respect any boundaries that one person might ask the other one to have. And if their boundaries aren't going to work for what you think that you need to explore, just, you know, break it off, man. (laughs) You don't have to like, you don't have to hurt yourself or compromise yourself. If you really feel that say monogamy is your, what you prefer and what you want, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're like conditioned by society. If you've really opened up your mind and thought about it and that's what your heart says you want, that's okay too. But if you also want to be more explorative or do something unconventional, that it's all about like the respect that we show each other at the end of the day and not holding each other back by a label or uh, unfair boundary. Exactly. Um, like I said, it all comes back to communication. You know, if you feel like you aren't able to communicate or, or whatever, like you should be able to be yourself, whether you're in a relationship, not in a traditional relationship, a non-traditional relationship, you should be able to be comfortable, be yourself and, and look to the horizon. You know what I mean? There's a metaphor for polyamory about, about a bird in a cage where they say like, oh, you have this beautiful bird that's singing in this cage, but it really wants to just like fly out of the cage. Like why, why put it in a cage at all? So it's just kind of a metaphor for, for that. And I thought was really interesting that kind of helped me formulate my views on some of this stuff. But yeah, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And to all the single people, we got this. <laughs> Sometimes being single is, is even better and, and helps you look inward can be tough and lonely, but if we're able to stand on our own two feet, then ultimately we'll be better in any relationship that we come across. Yeah. And it's only as lonely as you make it, right? There's always a chance to connect with people, even on a platonic level. And if you're doing that with the right people, then you're not going to feel so horribly lonely. (laughs) I mean, there's friends everywhere. And the best way, kind of like we talked about earlier, the best way to find your friends is to do your thing not to like go somewhere looking for friends or go somewhere looking for just pure entertainment. Like, yeah, if you're going to watch music because of the fact that it entertains you and you love it, that's maybe a little different because it's something that's something that's uh, the real culture, not the fake (laughs) TV culture. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Oh, one thing that we were talking about a little bit was your, art used for covers and stuff and you have like alien symbolism all over your your stuff and you do kind of use like folks folk music from different parts of the world and there's like a big connection between folk music and folklore about what maybe aliens used to be thought of as fairies and things like that do you have as big an interest in paranormal or folklore type things uh, uh, regarding aliens and other creatures or, or magic or the occult as your symbols might make it seem like you do? <laughs> yes. Underneath the surface, I'm very interested in magic and the occult. It's something that shaped who I was when I was a little bit younger. I had a spiritual awakening, you know, as I'm sure as many people do, but that being said, spiritual awakenings can fade and it's comes down to a matter of faith for me, but yeah, very interested in, in the paranormal and what else might be out there. And I've kind of wrapped it into my uh, branding and ethos in a way. There's just a lot out there. And when I got interested in the occult or whatever you want to call it, the paranormal, it was, it was because I was looking for something. I wanted to know if there was a God, if there was something out there. I was just like, what does any of this mean? And I found it. I found it and I, I try to take what I learned and live my life with, with these principles, you know, I think I used to have a temper when I was much younger, but something that after I started to get a little bit more spiritual kind of opened me up to like a more peaceful, chill way about things. And, you know, love's really at the heart of all of it. We can talk about aliens or the occult or Madame Blavatsky or Manly P. Hall or anybody that's into these kind of esoteric teachings and, And it all just comes back to love for me. You know, you can simplify it. If you want to know if there's a God or if there's aliens or ghosts or whatever, you go find them and I'm sure you'll find something. Uh, It's very exciting to me that the rabbit hole does exist. So I kind of went down the rabbit hole when I was interested in that stuff. And it was a personal journey to, to find what else is out there or to witness maybe something beyond just this 
the realm, the, the physical realm that, that we experience day to day, you know, you wake up, eat, work, go to sleep. Like there, I'm sure that there's plenty of people out there wondering what does all of this mean and where is all of this going? And, and rest assured that there, there are a lot of forces working uh, beneath the surface. There's more than meets the eye, basically. It's all very interesting stuff. And, you know, you can, you can go as far as you want. But at the end of the day, it kind of just boils down to the idea of love and, and friendship and how humans might be able to discover more about these concepts. Like maybe we don't know enough about love or laughter or friendship because they're some of the most powerful forces, I think, in the world. So I think looking forward into the future, maybe the more we as humans learn about this elusive concept of love or, or friendship or whatever, I think that's just only going to fare better for the planet and the global family. You know, we've got a lot on our shoulders at the moment as humans. There's a lot going on, you know, there. So I think over the next few decades, we'll probably learn how to treat each other a little bit differently and maybe change how we see one another. And I think that we'll, we'd be better off because of it. Right on. Did that yeah. answer your question? I don't know <laughs> if I talked about alien, aliens enough, but. No, you totally, no, I, <laughs> I mean, getting into the specifics about aliens is just diving deep into the subjective, but you did mention things below the surface and it's kind of interesting. One of the first occult tools that I picked up and integrated was using the I Ching. Have you ever checked out the I Ching before? It's like the calendar, right? No, it's like the, it's called the, it's known as the book of changes. That's what I Ching means in oh, Chinese. Okay. And it's like these 64 hexagrams. It's kind of like a tarot of this older system of magic. But I pull the card, which I don't usually do just before this episode, because I was curious, like what might come up. And I got 29, which is basically the water element and the water element stacked on top of each other. It represents like the deep abyss or the complete submergence in the waters of the unconscious and when you're talking about like this foundation under the surface of everything being love it's really talking about connectivity that everything is unified in a sense and this card the abyssal and the deep water is like a well or a rabbit hole that goes forever into the darkest recesses of the mind and the Subconscious is where all of these like liminal things like aliens or elves or creatures live. It's, it's emerging out of the sort of dreamlike womb of the unconscious. And the further I went in the spiritual path or studying the occult, the more clear it came, became to me that basically all the selves in the universe are derived from one self and that it's like a completely unified singular organism that we're all existing as parts of. So whenever we're talking about this stuff that's living in our unconscious, like the, the alien or the, whatever it might be, the Sasquatch, it's also a part of ourself that it, we're tapping into. And I think like that's the biggest lesson that going down any particular conspiracy rabbit hole or science fiction fantasy might <laughs> lead us to at least for me i mean it always comes back to that and then that also kind of uh revalidates the thing that you hear from the beginning which is that love is what matters because if you're whatever you're doing lovingly or whatever you're treating lovingly you're treating yourself that way yeah yeah i i i agree wholeheartedly there is a rabbit hole and if you want to go down it go down it look up things like terrence mckenna that sort of thing. And you might not find what you're looking for, but you'll find something. We look at the basic tenets of, of religion and they all pretty much say the same thing, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or Jewish or a Buddhist, like really kind of comes down to how you treat other people. And it kind of ties back into what you were saying about the I Ching, about us all being the same organism. We are all stuff that is attempting to thrive. I have kind of this belief that, that, that we are kind of all like the same thing, you know, like you said. So in one sense, I'm Steven and your chance, but in another sense, we are the same stuff communicating with itself. And I think that that perspective is really interesting and valuable because it helps you treat other people better. And you can see 
everything is an extension of you, you or yourself as an extension of the world. And I think it, it fares well for the uh, idea of symbiosis and coexistence. And we need to learn more about it probably in order to get to this next phase of evolution that we are in and this new paradigm shift, you know, there's a paradigm shift taking place and it's, it can be discouraging because you, because you think, Oh, is the, what's going to happen to the world? Like it's, it's so messed up and the wars and homelessness and suffering and, and hunger. But I think that every day uh, we're getting a little bit closer. There are more and more people realizing that love is what's going to save the planet and is, hippie or I- idealistic as that sounds like I can't find a better argument, you know? <laughs> yeah. The revolution in consciousness rather than the revolution on a battlefield or in forms of government. That's really where it's at. It's if we're going to ascend to the next level of this video game. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it has a lot to do with culture. You know what I mean? We all speak different languages. So uh, an American person has a really hard time relating to uh, someone from the East, you know, or, or whatever, like we just have to learn more about one another and kind of dissolve the borders in a way, even if it's you know, a mental thing, which is why I enjoy doing this type of music so much, you know, because I'm able to both learn about new cultures and expose people to new cultures because they might not have known that they really appreciate Middle Eastern music or music from China and I, I, I want to promote like a, a global, a global vibe, you know, one that implies that uh, like the new world where it doesn't matter where you come from or what language that you speak and we're just humans at the end of the day. And we all have very interesting things to share with one another. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think everyone's got to know at least a thing or two that nobody else has ever thought of that way or found out about. Or at least not the person that they're talking to in that moment, you know? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. so that's one of the cool things about festivals, too, is that synchronicities seem to happen there there more often. And as we were talking about before, you know, following your personal creative path being what leads you to the best reflections of what you need to know next to continue that path, (laughs) of course. It's like the opportunities appear as soon as the steps are taken or the intention is made. I was wondering if uh, you had any interesting coincidences or extreme synchronicity stories or paranormal experiences or UFOs you've seen (laughs) at opportune moments that you can think of. I did dive pretty deep into the paranormal when I was younger. So plenty of experiences like that. Synchronicities, for sure. I, I Right on the spot, I'm not sure I can think of any off the top of my head, but there have been those moments where I'm just like, is this going on inside my brain or is this the world? Like, and it really is a matter of faith. I feel like sometimes when you're feeling super spiritual, then you might see all these synchronicities where you're not feeling so good, then you won't be looking for them. So, and you might not see them and you wonder where have they gone? What, what, what is, what is going, where's the magic and what, how can I find it again? You know, that's something that sometimes when I'm feeling down or discouraged, I'm asking myself, how can I find it? And it's kind of almost the, the the wrong question to be asking because like I said, it's a matter of faith. Like for me personally, at least when I do have faith, even in those moments where I don't see the symbols and the signs around me, that can be a really important tool because, because it's going to get, get you to your next step. Like, I don't know. I, I, I just feel like faith is an important important aspect for me in this at this point in my life uh, i don't even really know what i mean by faith but kind of just in its essence like not being scared right not letting the destructive energy of fear slow you down or distort the leg of the journey that you're on that's kind of how i would interpret yeah. it at least in this context not faith in anything specific other than that everything's always going to work out in the best way that it can so just go with it kind of like believing in magic <laughs> yeah When you're feeling horrible, you probably won't believe in magic as much as you would as if you're feeling amazing. But I think it's really important to keep believing in it so that you don't dissolve your idea of it, you know, because the more and more you don't believe in something like magic, uh, 
the more it doesn't exist to you. <laughs> like quite literally, if you don't believe in something, how can it exist at all? Yeah, especially if the it's our consciousness that creates the reality that we experience, then for sure you better believe in what you want or you're not going to see it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. But I, I have one more big question for you. You are a well-researched, well-traveled man. I was wondering if there's anything going on in the world that you've discovered that maybe not a lot of people know about, but you think they should know about, or that maybe they can find a particular documentary or book that you recommend uh, to blow their mind. Hmm. Well, recently I've been really, I'm obviously really interested in, in, in language, different languages. I, don't, I only speak uh, English and then maybe a little bit of Spanish enough to get by, but I'm fascinated by language. And recently I've been watching a couple of polyglots on YouTube. A polyglot is someone that speaks many languages and I just find it fascinating. There's one guy called Lao Shu 50,500 on YouTube and he speaks something like 30 or 40 languages and he can just walk up to someone in the grocery store or something and be like, oh, are you, are you from China? And then he starts speaking Mandarin to them or, 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 or or French, or, or, or Arabic, or Somali. So he knows like 40 languages, and I just love watching him like connect with these people because they just light up, and they would never expect him or someone like him to even talk to them. So it's really cool to see someone communicating with all types of humans. And I think that there's a really important lesson to be learned there about where we're going in this global village, you know? So that has been really fascinating to me recently. So I would, I would encourage people to check out Lao Shu 50,500. It's L-A-O-S-H-U 505000 on, on YouTube. Truly inspiring stuff. And then another one is called a Shao Ma NYC. It's X-I-A-O-M-A NYC. It's this kid that lives in New York City that is fluent in ma Mandarin. He also speaks Cantonese and uh, a little bit of Fujianese. And it's just really cool because the people that he talks to are really appreciative of the fact that he's speaking their language to them. And I think that things like this are, are really productive and progressive in, in today's climate of separatism, you know. So, yeah, I'm fascinated by language. And that's one thing I've been checking out recently. So, yeah, what, what was the other part of your question? Oh, just that if there's anything going on in the world that you are became aware of that you think needs more mass awareness to uh, help it or heal it or that is just interesting or, or good and will make them happy to hear about. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I think that that was probably the best example because that's that has been just a really interesting thing to me because I'm because I'd love to see barriers dissolve and stuff. So to see two people from opposite sides of the planet communicating with one another, I think is a great example of where we need to go as humans. Yeah, absolutely. And then when it comes to studying the occult, you can throw out a lot of your research and just study the origins of language and etymology and what words really mean. <laughs> and then word magic will just start happening automatically with you. I mean, it's, it's almost like words are a programming code or language that is the operating system for the reality that you choose to exist in. And someone that can switch between that many different operating systems is definitely going to be at a more unified level of consciousness, just at a baseline. It would seem like there's a lot of interesting stuff with that. I've uh, even, I've heard that people that have, that are multilingual can be measured for different biomarkers and rhythms like resting heart, heart rate and pulse and stuff like that and blood pressure. And when they switch to speaking and thinking in different languages, that those biomarkers actually shift as if they're like changing characters. It's very bizarre. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. I know that sometimes when this guy is approaching someone in a language that, that, uh, that he's trying to practice, like he says like, Oh, his heart will be racing. Like, like while he's doing it. Interesting. <laughs> that could be a connection. I'm sure that people would like to know about my process for how I make music, you know, how I do it, that sort of thing. I do a lot of digging on YouTube. I do a lot of digging on iTunes. YouTube is the world's number one search engine now. So that's how I'm finding most of most of the music that, that I'm listening to now, whether it's 
contemporary dance music or hip hop from Africa or the Middle East or uh, old popular music from different cultures. I found that on YouTube. If you find a really great song, you can search that song and then go to the playlist filter and then you can see hundreds of people that have built playlists that, that include that song. And uh, that's been a really great way to find music. Searching in other languages is another really great way to find music. So if you find a phrase or something in another language, then copy and pasting in that language into the search bar, whether it's uh, Asian characters or Arabic or wh whatever. Um, that's another really great way to, uh, to find stuff beyond uh, our own culture. Because if you just go on YouTube and search traditional music from Syria, you'll only find a certain amount through a certain lens. But if you are actually uh, searching in the language, then you're going to find uh, way more authentic stuff. So that's, that's kind of how I find my samples. And when it comes to combining them, I'm using mix, a program called Mixed in Key, which roughly determines the musical key of each of the songs. You know, it's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty accurate. So then once I find the musical key, I'll have my whole iTunes sorted by, by key, basically. And then I'll see, oh, if I really want to remix this, this certain song from the 90s or whatever, I'll say, oh, look, it's a F minor. And then I'll look at the 300 other songs or whatever that are in F minor and then start fiddling around with them. And that's kind of a, my process for music. I'm, I'm putting out a new remix compilation on March 18th that everyone can listen to. I will be touring through the spring, summer and fall. It's kind of constant, but there are many pl new places that, that we're, we're going to. We're, I'm going to the Southeast a little bit more, the Midwest a little bit more. So hopefully everyone that wants to see a show is within a few hours that can that, and, and will be able to come. You know, I really appreciate everyone listening to my music. It is one of the greatest feelings in my life. I'm very grateful. And, you know, I'm happy that, that it helps people. You know, there was, there are some times where I wonder, oh, am I doing the right thing or am I helping people? But I think that, I've talked to enough people to know that the music does really help them. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be in service to them. I'm not in it to get rich and famous. I'm not in it for the ego. I really would just like to find myself and help others find themselves along the way and have a good time on the dance floor and promote this global culture that we've been talking about for the past hour, you know. Oh, thanks for the breakdown of some of your process. That is going to be well received, I'm sure. I should have thought to ask that. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, I mean, whether we're talking about life or music or anything, there's just there's a lot of there's a lot of bases to cover. But yeah, I, I have a very simple process and I'm willing to share just about anyone. I don't covet it, you know, like I I just want everyone to be able to do what they want to do. Cool, man. That's how I feel too. I want everyone to be able to do what they want to do and realize they can do it. All they gotta do is is take the steps. But Give them your website one more time and let them know the best place to tune in to your music and also the best social media to connect with you at if they want to give you a shout. Best places to listen to music are YouTube and SoundCloud. On YouTube, it's Suhan Radio. On SoundCloud, it's uh, Suhan on SoundCloud. My website is suhansuhan.com. Instagram is Suhan Suhan. And Facebook, facebook.com slash Suhan Beats. And I think that's about it. Yeah. Suhan Suhan on Twitter and uh, Suhan Suhan at Gmail. Suhan everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally all over the place. Going all around the world. Well, man, this has been super fun, especially for me as a big fan of your music for the last couple of years. Uh, thanks for giving us your time and good luck with your trip to Envision. I hope you have a really awesome time. Yeah, man. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I want to do more podcasts and interviews and kind of open format conversations like this. It's something I've been interested in for a really long time. And I just wanted to thank you for approaching me and, uh, you know, talking to me at the show and that kind of stuff. I don't know if I said this to you when I was there, but it's definitely people like yourself in my travels that make all of this worth it. There's so many kind people out there and, and we all got to lift each other up. Thank you for being a friend. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. I appreciate it as well. I'm happy to be friends with all the people that I have on the show. And 
it's actually like kind of like we said before, it's really accelerated my ability to connect with the type of people I want to connect with in life to be following what I find interesting to be doing, which is making this. So that's the best advice we could leave anyone with or the best idea we could leave anyone with is to just relentlessly do your thing and you'll make friends that you otherwise wouldn't have and they'll be really good ones. So <laughs> awesome. I agree, man. Happy Thank Valentine's you. Day also. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Thank you for doing what you do, man. And I, I wish you the best and success in your podcasts and, and creative endeavors. Hooray and huzzah. That's right. We made it to the end of another episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here all the way to the bitter end. Bittersweet. For it was sweet to me that I got to talk to Suhan or Steven, someone who I've loved their music for a long time. Maybe a little bitter that I wasn't able to record a plus extension. And by a little bitter, I mean not bitter at all. Actually, I totally understand because... If you're moving around the world at the rate that a producer like this is, it's not that easy to set aside that kind of time without seriously compromising something else. Or maybe there's literally just not the time and it wouldn't be the first instance where we couldn't get a plus extension from someone. And that's OK. Can't always do it, but we do try and we have a lot of plus extensions for anyone that wants to sign up and become a plus member because they like this show and they'd like to hear twice as much of it. Well, there's probably like 80 or more episodes that do have a two hour version instead of a one hour version. So you definitely won't be disappointed if you sign up patreon.com forward slash interverse. And yeah, big thank you to Stephen for coming on. It was really cool of him to, like I said, uh, get to know me a little bit while he was visiting our town to play a show and agree to do a podcast together. And maybe we can do something like this again, because it felt like we were scratching the surface of some of the deeper sides of this guy. And I would have liked to have gone further and maybe we can. One thing I liked that he talked about was contacting other people to do collabs or finding other artists to work with and how that requires a lot of effort. And it's not something that's just easy or automatic or a hundred percent you get what you want all the time, or at least your first try. And I think that's really good advice for someone like me who just kind of tries to do everything by myself when it comes to the show I'm making. So I don't, you know, have anyone else helping with social media or graphics or editing or anything really, or scheduling or reaching out and contacting people who would make good guests. All of those would be really useful help to have, <laughs> types of help to have. So I guess I'll just toss it out there to you guys. If you know anyone that you think could be a useful teammate for me to align with my goal of getting this podcast to more ears and getting more and more excellent guests on as time goes by, that would be great for any reason or any way that someone could maybe collab with me and in some way help out the show. I'd love to know about it. So yeah, I'm definitely inspired by the hustle that Suhan has got going on. <laughs> Steven, I always just want to call people who have a musical moniker by that moniker, but really dude's name is Steven. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind, but I'm inspired by his hustle with everything that he talked about and how he, fast he grew his musical career just by putting in the effort and believing in himself and working on the music side and the craft side. And it was really cool that he, also shared some of his process with all of us. That's not something that every artist necessarily always wants to do. But in my opinion, there's nothing better you can do than show someone the tools that work for you, because most likely they won't use them the same way you used them. <laughs> there's there's that. So there, the other thing is they might teach you something later down the line. You never know. Or right then and there, if you're teaching them in person, they might innovate something right before your eyes that could be useful to you. 
whether it's painting or making music on a computer screen or jamming with somebody on analog instruments, which is still pretty fun, despite the fact that we're in the age of digital everything. I really like talking to musicians because music brings us together in ways that we could never predict or even comprehend, maybe, perhaps. I don't know. I would say, for example, the event I went to um, in the middle of February, it was called like Kaleidoscope Art Show or something. It was at this climbing slash Ninja Warrior gym in Harrison, Arkansas. Not a huge shindig, but a bunch of local artists of different types got together and wanted to just break everyone out of their winter funk a little bit and have a fun event where we showcase art and have some music. And It was a really cool, good time. And I had one of those moments, apart from really enjoying getting out of the house, I had one of those moments of profound musical impact or musical epiphany, musically induced epiphany. I think these are really cool moments that they're kind of rare, but almost like as soon as you just start really paying attention to the music of your life, whatever form it's taking, just the present moment that you're in, you'll probably be able to dig down deep into that moment and find some great wisdom that you can take with you. And in the case of listening to music you've never heard before, that's heartfelt and coming from obviously a really good place, you can get amazing lessons out of that. Sometimes people write lyrics that they have no idea how that's going to hit you, or maybe they do. Maybe it's that good and they, (laughs) I don't know, but There was this really awesome guitar playing guy early in the show that I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the act, but he's playing an acoustic guitar and singing a song about planting a seed every day and pulling the weeds. And I was just like, oh, wow, of course. A lot of the lyrics that he was supplementing that phrase with made it all kind of click for me that what we do every day is like, something that we're watering or at the very least, if it's like bad thought patterns, it could be like a weed in the garden of our mind. I love the metaphor of the mind being like a garden too. I've definitely thought of that before, but sometimes you just forget about a a brilliant metaphor and it comes back to you. And the pulling of the weeds of the stuff in your mind could be actually sort of painful or hard if you've allowed that weed to grow for a long time and it's got deep, deep roots or You were too young to know what was and wasn't a weed yet. No one taught you how to manage the garden and you had to get a late start on it. And it's all overgrown and wild and bushy. (laughs) But those little things like reaching out to others online or something to try to connect for collaboration or, you know, like what we were talking about with Stephen earlier, that could be seen as planting a seed. Everything that you create. Even if it's just for fun, that could be seen as planting a seed because you never know what might sprout out of you following one interest or another. You really don't. And I just, yeah, just really love that entire metaphor. It was cool. And on top of that, I had a lot of fun talking to brilliant artists and running around a Ninja Warrior training facility, getting on my army crawl on, right, (laughs) in little tunnels and going down slides and climbing rock climbing walls. It was awesome. So I appreciate it. If anyone is listening to help put that event together, then I thank you for it because that was really cool. Another good thing we talked about with Suhan was the language topic. And that came up right at the end. And I would have liked to spend more time on it because there's something profound there. He was getting talking about getting into watching these people who are polyglots who could speak and master many languages at once. And I agree with what he said, that being able to speak to someone in their own language is definitely a way of breaking down barriers and bringing us closer to oneness. Of course, we all probably are familiar with that Tower of Babel story that the languages were split and people couldn't build the tower to heaven or whatever you take that metaphor to be representing. There's a lot of options. But not only does language tear down barriers between people and allow us to communicate with each other. It allows us to communicate with the past. And I think that might even be more interesting in a way because we can see what 
was going on in the past and how it shaped our current time by looking at what words we inherited and what like the roots mean and what the different parts of the word mean. And you can break down words and get really interesting results. It's something you would call green language in magic or the occult, which is sort of like interpreting words on a bunch of different dimensions. First, how it sounds, how it feels as a word, and then also on an etymological level, what do the roots mean? And when you combine them together, what is it that you're getting? And when it comes to like contract language and legalese, that's where it gets really weird. And the definitions of stuff matters quite a bit. The green language thing has a lot to do with kind of like puns and wordplay as well to see multiple meanings in one word or sentence. For example, earth is an anagram for heart. You can switch up the letters just slightly and you've got it. Someone who was on the show quite a while back that gave us a really good breakdown of all this was Laurel Arica or Laurel Erica. I guess it's Erica. Whoops. I would check that episode out. I want to have her back soon. So maybe we can do some more language exploring and possibly talk about polyglots while we're on the topic and whether or not it's true that you can easily master and learn many languages if you just have the right learning method. I don't know. It'd be kind of cool if I could just within a couple of years, all of a sudden know like four or five languages or more, right? I think we would all like to be able to do that. But yeah, it's time to pull this train into the old station and finish her off. So thanks for being here and listening to the show. Thanks again, Stephen Suhan. Everyone make sure to go to suhansuhan.com or find Suhan on whatever you like to listen to music on because I'm sure it's there. S-O-O-H-A-N. And I'll play us out with a little bit of uh, Suhan, some of my favorites. I don't know if they're favorites because I like a lot of what he makes, pretty much all of it. But some that I definitely know I like and want to share. So let's do it. It's going down. Drop out.